Hello, and welcome back to Baby Elias's Stories. We now return to The Time Machine by H. G. Wells. Chapter 11 I have already told you of the sickness and confusion that comes with time travelling, and this time I was not seated properly in the saddle, but sideways and in an unstable fashion. For an indefinite time I clung to the machine as it swayed and vibrated, quite unheeding how I went, and when I brought myself to look at the dials again, I was amazed to find where I had arrived. One dial records days, and another thousands of days, another millions of days, and another thousands of millions. Now, instead of reversing the levers, I had pulled them over so as to go forward with them. And when I came to look at these indicators, I found that the thousand's hand was sweeping round as fast as the second's hand, as fast as the second's hand of a watch into futurity. As I drove on, peculiar change crept over the appearance of things. The palpitating greyness grew darker, and then, though I was still travelling with prodigious velocity, the blinking succession of day and night, which was usually of a slower pace, returned and grew more and more marked. This puzzled me very much at first. The alternations of night and day grew slower and slower, and so did the passage of the sun across the sky until they seemed to stretch through centuries. At last a steady twilight brooded over the earth, a twilight only broken now and then when a comet glared across the darkling sky. The band of light that had indicated the sun had long since disappeared, for the sun had ceased to set. It simply rose and fell in the west, and grew ever broader and more red. All trace of the moon had vanished. The circling of the stars, growing slower and slower, had given place to creeping points of light. At last, some time before I stopped, the sun, red and very large, halted motionless up on the horizon. A vast dome glowing with a dull heat and now and then suffering a momentary extinction. At one time it had, for a little while, glowed more brilliantly again, but it speedily reverted to its sullen red heat. I perceived by this slowing down of its rising and setting that the work of the tidal drag was done. The earth had come to rest with one face to the sun, even as in our own time the moon faces the earth. Very cautiously, for I remembered my former headlong fall, I began to reverse my motion. Slower and slower went the circling hands until the thousands one seemed motionless, and the daily one was no longer a mere mist upon its scale. Still slower until the dim outlines of a desolate beach grew visible. I stopped very gently and sat upon the time machine, looking around. The sky was no longer blue. Northeastward it was inky black, and out of the blackness shone brightly and steadily the pale white stars. Overhead it was a deep Indian red and starless, and southeastward it grew brighter to a glowing scarlet, where Cut by the horizon lay the huge hull of the sun, red and motionless. The rocks about me were of a harsh reddish colour, and all the trace of life that I could see at first was the intensely green vegetation that covered every projecting point on their south-eastern face. It was the same rich green that one sees on forest moss or on the lynching in caves. Plants which, like these, grow in a perpetual twilight. The machine was standing on a sloping beach. 
the sea stretched away to the southwest, to rise into a sharp, bright horizon against the wan sky. There were no breakers and no waves, for not a breath of wind was stirring. Only a slight oily swell rose and fell. Only a slight oily swell rose and fell like a gentle breathing and showed that the eternal sea was still moving and living. And along the margin where the water sometimes broke was a thick encrustation of salt pink under the lurid sky. There was a sense of oppression in my head and I noticed that I was breathing very fast. The sensation reminded me of my only experience of mountaineering and from that I judged the air to be more rarefied than it is now. Far away up the desolate slope I heard a harsh scream. I saw a thing like a huge white butterfly go slanting and flittering up into the sky and circling, disappear over some low hillocks beyond. The sound of its voice was so dismal that I shivered and seated myself more firmly upon the machine. Looking round me again, I saw that, quite near, what I had taken to be a reddish mass of rock was moving slowly towards me. Then I saw the thing was really a monstrous, crab-like creature. Can you imagine a crab as large as yonder table? with its many legs moving slowly and uncertainly, its big claws swaying, its long antennae, like craters' whips, waving and feeling, and its stalked eyes gleaming at you on either side of its metallic front. Its back was corrugated and ornamented with ungainly bosses, and a greenish incrustation blotched it here and there. I could see the many palps of its complicated mouth flickering and feeling as it moved. As I stared at this sinister apparition crawling towards me, I felt a tickling on my cheek as though a fly had lighted there. I tried to brush it away with my hand, but in a moment it returned and almost immediately came another by my ear. I struck at this and caught something thread-like. It was drawn swiftly out of my hand with a frightful qualm. I turned and I saw that I had grasped the antenna of another monster crab that stood just behind me. Its evil eyes were wriggling on their stalks. Its mouth was all alive with appetite and its vast ungainly claws. Smeared with an algal smile, with an algal smile, with an algal slime were descending upon me. In a moment my hand was on the lever, and I had placed a month between myself and these monsters, but I was still on the same beach, and I saw them distinctly now as soon as I stopped. Dozens of them seemed to be crawling here and there in the somber light, among the foliated sheets of intense green. I cannot convey the sense of abominable desolation that hung over the world. The red eastern sky, the northward blackness, the salt dead sea, the stony beach crawling with these foul, slow, stirring monsters, the uniform, poisonous looking green of the lynchinous plants, the thin air that hurts one's lungs, all contributed to an appalling effect. I moved on a hundred years, and there was the same red sun, a little larger, a little duller, the same dying sea, the same chill air, and the same crowd of earthly crustacea creeping in and out among the green weed and the red rocks. And in the westward sky I saw a curved pale line like a vast new moon. So I travelled, stopping ever and again in great strides of a thousand years or more, drawn on by the mystery of the earth's fate, watching with a strange fascination the sun grow larger and duller in the westward sky, and the life of the old earth ebb away. At last, more than thirty million years hence, the huge red-hot 
dome of the sun had become, had come to obscure nearly a tenth part of the darkling heavens. Then I stopped once more, for the crawling multitude of crabs had disappeared, and the red beach, save for its livid green liverworts and lichens, seemed lifeless. And now it was flecked with white. A bitter cold assailed me. Rare white flakes ever and again came eddying down. To the north eastward, the glare of snow lay under the starlight of the sable sky, and I could see an undulating crest of hillocks, pinkish white. There were fringes of ice along the sea margin, with drifting masses further out, but the main expanse of that salt ocean, all bloody under the eternal sunset, was still unfrozen. I looked about me to see if any traces of animal life remained. A certain undefiable apprehension still kept me in the saddle of the machine. But I saw nothing moving, in earth or sky or sea. The green slime on the rocks alone testified that life was not extinct. A shallow sandbank had appeared in the sea and the water had receded from the beach. I fancied I saw some black object flopping about upon this bank, but it became motionless as I looked at it, and I judged that my eye had been deceived, and that the black object was merely a rock. The stars in the sky were intensely bright and seemed to me to the transit of an inner planet passing very near to the earth. The darkness grew apace. A cold wind began to blow in freshening gusts from the east. And the showering white flakes in the air increased in number. From the edge of the sea came a ripple and whisper. Beyond these lifeless sounds, the world was silent. Silent? It would be hard to convey the stillness of it. All the sounds of man, the bleating of sheep, the cries of birds, the hum of insects, the stir that makes the background of our lives all that was over. The stir that makes the background of our lives all that was over. As the darkness thickened, the eddying flakes grew more abundant, dancing before my eyes, and the cold of the air more intense. At last, one by one, swiftly, one after the other, the white peaks of the distant hills vanished into blackness. The breeze rose to a moaning wind. I saw the black central shadow of the eclipse sweeping towards me. In another moment, the pale stars alone were visible. All else was rayless obscurity. The sky was absolutely black. A horror of this great darkness came on me. The cold that smote to my marrow and the pain I felt in breathing overcame me. I shivered and a deadly nausea seized me. Then, like a red hot bow in the sky, appeared the edge of the sun. I got off the machine to recover myself. I felt giddy and incapable of facing the return journey. I felt giddy and incapable of facing the return journey. As I stood sick and confused, I saw again the moving thing upon the shoal. There was no mistake now that it was a moving thing. Against the red water of the sea, it was a round thing, the size of a football perhaps, or it may be bigger, and tentacles trailed down from it. It seemed black against the weltering blood-red water, and it was hopping fruitfully and it was hopping fitfully about. Then I felt I was fainting, but a terrible dread of lying helpless in that remote and awful twilight sustained me while I clambered upon the saddle. Chapter 12 So I came back. For a long time I must have been insensible upon the machine. The blinking succession of the days and nights were resumed. The sun got golden again, the sky blue. I breathed with greater freedom. 
the fluctuating contours of the land ebbed and flowed. The hands spun backward upon the dials. At last I saw again the dim shadows of houses, the evidences of decandent humanity. These two changed and passed, and others came. Presently, when the million dial was at zero, I slackened speed. I began to recognize our own petty and familiar architecture. The thousands ran, and the thousands hand ran back to the starting point. The night and day flapped slower and slower. Then the old walls of the laboratory came round me. Very gently now, I slowed the mechanism down. I saw one little thing that seemed odd to me. I think I have told you that when I set out, before my velocity became very high, Mrs. Watchett had walked across the room travelling, as it seemed to me, like a rocket. As I returned, I passed again across that minute when she traversed the laboratory. But now her every motion appeared to be the exact inverse of her previous ones. The door at the lower end opened, and she glided quietly up the laboratory, back foremost, and disappeared behind the door by which she had previously entered. Just before that, I seemed to see Hillier for a moment, but he passed like a flash. Then I stopped the machine and saw about me again the old familiar laboratory, my tools, my appliances, just as I had left them. I got off the thing very shaky and sat down upon my beach, and sat down upon my bench, for several minutes I trembled violently. Then I became calmer. Around me was my old workshop again, exactly as it had been. I might have slept there, and the whole thing have been a dream. And yet, not exactly. The thing had started from the southeast corner of the laboratory. It had come to rest again in the northwest, against the wall where you saw it. That gives you the exact distance from my little lawn to the pedestal of the White Sphinx, into which the Morlocks had carried my machine. For a time my brain was stagnant. Presently I got up and came through the passage here, limping because my heel was still painful and feeling sorely begrimmed. I saw the Paul Mall Gazette on the table by the door. I found the date was indeed today and looking at the timepiece saw the hour was almost eight o'clock. I heard your voices and the clatter of plates. I hesitated. I felt so sick and weak. Then I sniffed some good wholesome meat and opened the door on you. You know the rest. I washed and dined and now I am telling you the story. I know, he said after a pause, that all this will be absolutely incredible to you. To me, the one incredible thing is that I am here tonight in this old familiar room, looking into your friendly faces and telling you these strange adventures. He looked at the medical man. No, I cannot expect you to believe it. Take it as a lie or a prophecy. Say I dreamed it in the workshop. Consider I have been speculating upon the destinies of our race until I have hatched this fiction. Treat my assertion of its truth as a mere stroke of art to enhance its interest, and taking it as a story, what do you think of it? He took up his pipe and began, in his old accustomed manner, to tap it nervously upon the bars of the grate. There was a momentary stillness. Then chairs began to creak and shoes to scrape upon the carpet. I took my eyes off the time traveller's face and looked round at his audience. They were in the dark, and little spots of colour swam before them. The medical man seemed absorbed in the contemplation of our host. The editor was looking hard at the end of his cigar. The sixth. The journalist fumbled for his watch. The others, as far as I remember, were motionless. The editor stood up with a sigh. What a pity it is your, what a pity it is you are, what a pity it is you're not a writer of stories, he said, putting his hand on the time traveller's shoulder. You don't believe it. Well, 
I thought not. The time traveller turned to us. Where are the matches? He said. He lit one and spoke over his pipe, puffing. To tell you the truth, I hardly believe it myself. And yet, his eye fell with a mute inquiry upon the withered white flowers, upon the little table. Then he turned over the hand holding his pipe, and I saw he was looking at some half-healed scars on his knuckles. The medical man rose, came to the lamp, and examined the flowers. The gymnasium's odd, he said. A psychologist leaned forward to see, holding out his hand for a specimen. I'm hanged if it isn't a quarter to one, said the journalist. How shall we get home? Plenty of cabs at the station, said the psychologist. It's a curious thing, said the medical man, but I certainly don't know the natural order of these flowers. May I have them? The time traveller hesitated. Then suddenly, certainly not. Where did you really get them? said the medical man. The time traveller put his hand to his head. He spoke like one who was trying to keep hold of an idea that eluded him. They were put into my pocket by Wiener when I travelled into time. He stared round the room. I'm damned if it isn't all going. This room and you and the atmosphere of every day is too much for my memory. Did I ever make a time machine, or a model of a time machine, or is it all only a dream? They say life is a dream, a precious poor dream at times, but I can't stand another that won't fit. It's madness. And where did the dream come from? I must look at that machine, if there is one. He caught up the lamp swiftly and carried it, flaring red through the door into the corridor. We followed him. There in the flickering light of the lamp was the machine, sure enough, squat, ugly and askew, a thing of brass, ebony, ivory and translucent, glimmering quartz, solid to the touch, for I put out my hand and felt the rail of it, and with brown spots and smears upon the ivory and bits of grass and moss upon the lower parts, and one rail bent awry. The time traveller put the lamp down on the bench and ran his hand along the damaged rail. It's all right now, he said. The story I told you was true. I'm sure to have brought you out here in the cold. I'm sorry to have brought you out here in the cold. He took up the lamp and in an absolute silence, we returned to the smoking room. He came into the hall with us and helped the editor on with his coat. The medical man looked into his face and with a certain hesitation told him he was suffering from overwork, at which he laughed hugely. I remember him standing in the open doorway, bawling good night. I shared a cab with the editor. He thought the tale was a gaudy lie. For my own part, I was unable to come to a conclusion. The story was so fantastic and incredible, the telling so credible and sober. I lay awake most of the night thinking about it. I determined to go next day and see the time traveller again. I was told he was in the laboratory, and being on easy terms in the house, I went up to him. The laboratory, however, was empty. I stared for a minute at the time machine and put out my hand and touched the lever. At that, at that, the squat, substantial-looking mass swayed like a bow shaken by the wind. Its instability startled me extremely, and I had a queer reminiscence of the childish days when I used to be forbidden to meddle. I came back through the corridor. The time traveller met me in the smoking room. He was coming from the house. He had a small camera under one arm and a knapsack under the other. He laughed when he saw me and gave me an elbow to shake. I'm frightfully busy, he said he, with that thing in there. But is it, but is it not some hoax? 
I said. Do you really travel through time? Really and truly I do. And he looked frankly into my eyes. He hesitated. His eye wandered about the room. I only want half an hour, he said. I know why you came, and it's awfully good of you. There's some magazines here. If you'll stop to lunch, I'll prove you this time traveling up to the hilt, specimen and all, if you'll forgive my leaving, you know. If, you, if you'll forgive my leaving you now. I consented, hardly comprehending then the full import of his words, and he nodded and went on down the corridor. I heard the door of the laboratory slam, seated myself in a chair, and took up a daily paper. What was he going to do before lunchtime? Then suddenly I was reminded by an ad advertisement that I had promised to meet Richardson, the publisher, at two. I looked at my watch and saw that I could barely save that engagement. I got up and went down the passage to tell the time traveller. As I took hold of the handle of the door, I heard an exclamation, an oddly turncated, oddly truncated at the end, and a click and a thud. A gust of air whirled round me as I opened the door, and from within came the sound of broken glass falling on the floor. The time traveller was not there. I seemed to see a ghostly, indistinct figure sitting in a whirling mass of black and brass for a moment. A figure so transparent that the bench, that the bench behind with its sheets of drawings was absolutely distinct. But this phantasm vanished as I rubbed my eyes. The time machine had gone. Save for a subsiding stir of dust, the further end of the laboratory was empty. A pane of the skylight had apparently just been blown in. I felt an unreasonable amazement. I knew that something strange had happened, and for the moment could not distinguish what the strange thing might be. As I stood staring, the door into the garden opened, and the man-servant appeared. We looked at each other. Then ideas began to come. Has Mr. gone out that way? said I. No, sir. No one has come out this way. I was expecting to find him here. At that, I understood. At the risk of disappointing Richardson, I stayed on. At the risk of disappointing Richardson, I stayed on, waiting for the time traveller, waiting for the second, perhaps still stranger story, in the specimens and photographs he would bring with him. But I am beginning now to fear that I must wait a lifetime. The time traveller vanished three years ago, and as everybody knows now, he has never returned. Epilogue One cannot choose but wonder, will he ever return? It may be that he swept back into the past and fell among the blood-drinking, hairy savages of the age of unpolished stone, into the abysses of the Cretaceous Sea, or among the grotesque Saurians, the huge reptilian brutes of the Jurassic times. He may even now, if I may use the phrase, be wandering on some plesiosaurus haunted old lytic coral reef, or beside the lonely saline lakes of the Triassic age? Or did he go forward into one of the nearer ages in which men are still men, but with the riddles of our own time answered and its wearisome problems solved? Into the manhood of the race, for I, for my own part, cannot think that these latter days of weak experiment, fragmentary theory, and mutual discord are indeed man's culminating time. I say, for my own part. He, I know, for the question had been discussed among us long before the time machine was made, thought but cheerlessly of the advancement of mankind 
and saw in the growing pile of civilization only a foolish heaping that must inevitably fall back upon and destroy its makers in the end. If that is so, it remains for us to live as though it were not so. But to me, the future is still black and blank, is a vast ignorance, lit at a few casual places by the memory of his story. And I have by me for my comfort two strange white flowers, shriveled now, and brown and flat and brittle, to witness that even when mind and strength had gone, gratitude and a mutual tenderness still live on in the heart of man. The end. Good night, baby Elias. Good night, John Wolfe. Oh.